welcome to episode 5 of Mama Tales. As always, I'm grateful that you are here and you have been enjoying the content so far. If this is your first time, welcome. This is a space where we get to learn from each other and grow together as parents. Today's episode is special. To celebrate Father's Day, I've decided to feature a story by one awesome dad, my husband. In his story, you will hear about his strong sense of family, his fears and ideas about being a girl dad and an overall great person. I could be biased, but I think he's just the best and this journey would look vastly different if he wasn't a part of it. Our daughter and him share a type of bond that I'm jealous of, one that I wish I had with my own dad. I loved my father so much. I just wish that he was more present to connect and bond. But for most of my life, he traveled for work. I lost him quite tragically in 2015, right after he had just settled down. And I don't think this is something that I have fully healed from yet. I get bouts of grief and sadness here and there and that feeling that, you know, he would have been a great granddad, but unfortunately he's not here. Anyways, this Father's Day, I think of him as I celebrate my husband for being the best dad that I know. I won't talk too much this time uh, because I think we should just get right into his story. So let's take a listen. Today's storyteller is someone very close to my heart, my husband. This man has been by my side from the very, very beginning. We undertake this journey together every single day. We wake her up together and we take her to bed together. This has happened every day, I kid you not. So I'm very intrigued and curious to hear more about this journey through his eyes. Hey guys, my name is Muruthi Toita. I'm a husband to this beautiful Mama Taylor, full-time dad to Keo and software engineer by profession. I grew up in a big extended family. The families were not perfect, but they were great families and it made such a great and lasting impression on, on me. And I wanted to share that with somebody later on down the line and I grew really really passionate about having a family all my own later on down the line. I I have a feeling it's it has quite a bit to do with how for example I'm called Moruthi and my brother is called Mwangi and during you know our family reunions in the Moruthi side of the family if you guys know a bit about Kekwe culture where I'm named after my grandfather and Mwangi is named after my grandfather as well on mom's side. Just the mere fact that I was called dad by my aunties and my uncles and Mwangi was called dad by our aunties and our uncles on our mother's side. I think that had a sort of lasting impression on us. In the sense you felt very intertwined with the whole family in a big, big way and I really wanted that for my children as well. So it's a deep thing I'd say and it's something that I've carried for a very, very long time. I'd say a big part of why I wanted to be a father is my African culture, is my Gekoyo culture and you know just that idea of continuity and giving back what you are given, as in the life you are given, giving that to someone is a big part of why I chose to be a father. And it's a huge responsibility. I didn't appreciate it before I got care, but it's a responsibility I'm willing to take. So from the onset, I did know that I was going to do this with somebody who I thought was the right fit for me. And yeah, Sally was that right fit. And for some reason, we did lock in perfectly. So Sally comes to the office, says she's in so much pain. Not typical of Sally to say she's in so much pain. If Sally says we need to go, we need to go. So we go to the hospital, which is quite close, thankfully. Take quite a bit of time, you know, saying in, have, you know, insurance, blah, blah, blah. But we finally uh, see a doctor. They perform some few tests. By now, we didn't think it was pregnancy. What we then did was, you know, just sat down and waited. But for some reason, given we had done the lab tests and all, we had a feeling that, you know, this was something about Sally's womb. And we had we started getting that fear of, are we going to get babies or not? And it was, oh, that, I, I, that was scary. It was very, very scary to have that idea that this thing that you've been waiting for is not going to happen. We look at the results. T 
typical Dr. Mambo Jambo. So it doesn't make sense to us. Start googling some stuff. And then we see this cyst thing that we don't understand so we search for that online see that this is something that can cause complications in pregnancy and that's when it goes off we are like you know crazy we are never going to have babies of our own so we enter the the examination room the doctor is just you know reading through the results very serious face looking the other side and then she decides that this is above her knowledge base I think she was not a specialist in that said uh, field and tells us that she needs to get somebody else to come explain to us the results. So we are like, this must be really bad, by the way. How we get even more disappointed in one way or another. I, 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 I could feel it myself. The specialist comes and goes through the results. Very, very nice lady. And she starts talking and talking in typical doctor fashion. So starts with like, you know, this is a cyst. It's usually something that didn't develop when you are growing and it's still currently new. It might, you know, bring some complications during uh, your pregnancy. But then, do you guys know you're pregnant? So after that, I'd care less what she said. <laughs> I felt so, so, so happy. I started thinking about, you know, all the, it, it all came back. The feeling of family, just wanting to have a family of your own. And I was starting that journey. I'd started it, you know, by marriage, but we are now getting somebody of our own in a sense. And it felt so 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 good i remember and i don't know why and i'm telling sally this as we for the first time as well i had a feeling it was going to be a daughter i don't know why i've always known my first child was going to be a daughter i had grown up in a family of boys only me and my younger brother we didn't have sisters and i always wanted a daughter for myself but for one reason or the other i'd have you know wanted her to not be the first board. And there are a few reasons for that. Given the world we live in, I'd have wanted an elderly brother figure that, you know, can just sort of protect my daughter. And I know how that sounds coming from me. But from the time I started dating Mugure, which was, I'd say, eight years, seven years before we got to this particular position in our lives, a lot had happened to Mugure that seemed normal for her and totally out of place for me. So, for example, small things like, oh, today I was passing by the market and 16 guys cat called me. I'm like, is that something that always happens? Why are you making that sound very, very normal? The uncomfortability you get as a lady strolling through life just trying to do your thing is so much i'd say yeah i'm I'm obviously looking through it uh through mogure's eyes but i'd never appreciated them in one way or another so that was also another huge eye-opener for me and i know having a bigger brother would not solve everything for my beautiful daughter but it's something it's better than her facing the world by herself but that's a heavy one for me to be quite honest and so i really wanted to have a son just because of that but in hindsight i know keo as my daughter will grow up to be a very 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 awesome person and she'll be protected by not only us but by herself as well by the knowledge that we'll give her in one way or another and she'll grow up to be protected by, you know, even forces that are beyond our understanding, if I may say so. And that's all I can, you know, pray for. But I do hope that the world can be a better place for women. And as it stands, it's not a good place for women. To be quite honest, I, and I know I'm talking from the outside looking in but it from my experiences it's not and i don't want a better scenario for my daughter 
and i think it also raises a broader question of why the world is the way it is in a sense and the media we consume does it create that idea that you know cat calling or having your way or all these nasty things that happen does media normalize it does society normalize that and as parents who are going to raise up both boys and girls and have to impact them that knowledge i believe we should take a very very hands on approach in making sure that we impact the right knowledge we make sure that we can confidently say that you know this is wrong and it's wrong for these reasons and not just let it pass by that you know ah it's the way of the world that's what boys tease girls that's how it happens and then something that just started as simple as it's just a tease and then it's cut calling and then before you know it all these other things have to ha- happen and let's not normalize such things there needs to be a huge respect for for the parties in a sense and as parents we should make sure that we are teaching our children the right things and we are consuming the right media as well so i think media has a huge part to play as well we were well prepared or so we thought we were well prepared so we had gone to bath class and had great support from that standpoint in a sense so these are the positions you need to take if you want to you know engage the baby you need to know about the you know each and every little thing was discussed in bath class and I'd highly encourage any couple that is going through the same or any individual that is going through the same to attend bath class because it really really helps just understanding what is happening with your body so labor starts okay so it let's start a, a while back so it's around may 8th the due date for care was on may 10th so sally starts getting you know sort of like braxton hicks but they are stronger so we are like at this actually what we'd call contractions or is it something different so the contractions start and so we are like you know these are actually contractions we are counting them we are all excited but for some reason it just stops and then we are like okay and it stops and never comes back for you know it's may 9th now no contractions may 10th no contractions may 11th no contractions <laughs> so yeah man that that give sally a lot of pressure because you know everyone is personally i'm like you know hey babes you're not feeling anything and i can try to be as not want to ask as uh, as much as possible but i really want to get this over and done with and get this baby here in hindsight i'd have done a better job just trying to settle everyone's uh, nerves down but for the first one things just go crazy so we just you know wait we do what we need to do we had this place in westgate where we used to get uh red leaf tea a lot of pineapples from some guy that sells them uh, um, along the road i think we b- i bought like five pineapples <laughs> and sally i sat sally down and she ate all those pineapples she hated me for that so <laughs> story for another day uh so it's may 15th uh, i've just settled in to bed sally comes you know says the time is now i can't believe it or i could believe it but i didn't want to have the experience we had in may 8th where nothing happened and yet something had started so I tried to you know downplay it just so that we don't have to you know go through the same thing that we ha- that had happened and then it continues it continues it continues we try to sleep just so that we can see you know if this thing is actually going to continue by itself but it still continues and by now sally's water had broke just a bit and clearly the signs were there that this is actually this is actually it so i can't remember the detail uh, the nitty gritties of how that whole thing went but what i remember is we did wake up at 
in the middle of the night, I'd say around 4, 5 a.m. and came to the sitting room actively contracting. So I'm really helping with, you know, things like just the positions we learned in birth class, just trying to reenact them at home so that uh, she's as comfortable as possible and helping her in any way possible. And, you know, thinking about everything as well. Do we have our bag in place? How do we go to the hospital if need be? And yeah, we end up going to the hospital at 9 a.m. Sally has dilated three centimeters and it's good. We at least, you know, we, we have something to work to. So we get into the labor room. Let's continue. Let's get the three, these three centimeters to 10 centimeters and get KO here. So we go into the labor room, start our, you know, exercises, all the positions we can think about. Sally is pacing around as well. I believe that, you know, this was my part to play and I was going to play it well. For <laughs> I was going to make sure that I did my part in making sure that, you know, this baby came to be. And if I needed to make Sal do lunges because she needed to do lunges, we'd do that. So the day continues. I'd say it's around 5 p.m. now. That's when we started in, uh, inducing the labor, right? And nothing has moved. You know, it's 5 p.m. already. We are supposed to be at least five. I'd say even just give us five centimeters so that we see something is moving, but nothing is moving. And the beautiful plan we had in place is clearly coming into shambles. Something I'd also like to point out is just also when writing down your plan, don't look at the best case scenario only. Also look at these other edge cases as well since you don't know what might happen when you get into labor and there are a lot of i'd say things that might happen when you're getting into labor so 5 p.m to 9 p.m still three centimeters so clearly this is not working i wish we had been at home that's that's a big wish i'd, I'd have wanted and i know sally would have wanted as well just because of the comfortability it gives you and I was a big I was very very pro the whole home bath kind of situation and Sally was not for it in a sense and I, I'd like us to talk about that but I respected that this wasn't as I was you know I was the coach I said, would I say I was the coach I'd say I was the support staff <laughs> <laughs> and Sally was you know the player and the whole team so as a support staff, I, I needed to do my place in a sense. So, yeah. So, and I think she made the right call. Given she had that intuition, that motherly intuition that I really respect, she knew she needed to be in the hospital and not at home doing this fully. So, what I just wanted to get out is that intuition of doing that. What you needed for Keo to get here was a hospital whereas it might be different for somebody else i just the appreciation of intuition is something i think we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis like the same intuition i had knowing that it's actually going to be a daughter <laughs> so that intuition okay sometimes it might be wrong sometimes it might be right but when you feel something strongly just go with it i'd say yeah trust your gut so it's 9 p.m our doctor comes in says that you know we need to perform a CS since nothing is moving on so i feel a lot of fear now given it's not as if i wasn't feeling fear before but you know now it's a surgery it's not what i'd say what we had planned to do but at the end of the day i know it's the right thing to do given that's where as it stands, nothing is sort of moving on. So she's taken into the, the theater. I can't join her, so I'm waiting outside. So I'd say I started waiting from 9.30 since she entered. So I'm waiting, not patiently, but I'm waiting. <laughs> and from 9.30 till 10.34 when Keo was born, that was, I'd say, the longest one hour of my life. Because I'm wondering, is everyone going to be okay? Is Sally, most importantly, going to be okay? 
is Keo going to be okay? And by turn 34, I had Keo cry from afar. Keo being Keo, Keo has to announce to this world that she has arrived. Keo, Keo has a huge set of lungs in her and she always wants to use them. She's very opinionated. So I hear the cry. I think it might be her, but I don't want to make that assumption. But after a few minutes, she's wheeled in by the pediatrician, looking so beautiful. The first thing I remember saying was, you know, she has Sally's nose. <laughs> and I, for some reason, I didn't see all the similarities we had with her. I don't know why. Could be because she was also tired and it shows on her face when she, because she comes out, babies, newborns come, come out very, very puffy due to the tiredness of you know that whole labor experience so i think maybe or maybe it was also tired as well i it could be either or and i didn't appreciate that at first i appreciated that the next day uh but you know she's here well and good how is my wife doing and it was quite quite scary no not knowing what is going on in a sense you know this is nothing planned it was an emergency cs as they put it and I remember we took Keo to the nursery, well and good. I called my parents. They came uh, quite fast, actually, since the hospital is not too far from where we live. Also saw the also saw Keo very very excited. But for me, I wasn't I wasn't feeling comfortable until I saw Sal. And it's no use having this beautiful baby if you don't have the person you created her with next to you and right now like i had no part to play you know at least in the labor experience you have a part to play you can you know do the lunges and do everything and help her with that but for this it was totally the doctors and sally and there's a lot of fear in the unknown that's what i'd say so when they finally wheeled her back to her labor room so that was i think at around 11 30 i'd say so it's already another longest hour of my life another one just after i had a long hour of my life i was so relieved to just see her it was nice having my my mom's around but it would have been better if you know i had a friend of mine around you know even even my brother i'd say just around for that whole experience just having somebody you know who can just calm you down in such a scenario where you don't have any control. I think the idea is just, given you don't have the control, you're handing over the control to the doctors, you're handing over the control to an external party. Having somebody you can, you know, just rely on, just to, who knows you, who can calm you down, goes a long way. So, yeah, that's something I'd really advise uh, anybody getting into this and who wants to support their partner have somebody who can support you as well. Baby is here, Sally is well. I'm happy. I, I preferred meeting her together. I, it was only fair. So maybe maybe part of me not wanting to meet her. So a bit of context in regards to that. So we are meeting I'm meeting her the second time. You are meeting her the first time, right? And for me the first time felt it felt a bit unnatural I'd say given in our original birth plan, the idea was, you know, we'd meet her together and Sally would have skin and skin time with her. So when I saw her alone, it felt as if I know how much Sally would have loved to be here for this. And in hindsight, I think what I was feeling was more like I shouldn't be doing this if Sally is not here, in a sense. It's as if I was cheating on Sally. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's why I didn't savor the moment as much for the first time as I did for the second time. Now, given it's both of us, we are looking at her. I remember since Sally was on the bed, Kay was on her court. I was, you know, just looking at her so beautiful with her two hands and everything. So I hand Kay to Sally. So she's she like opens up her face and then she has this way she where she I think is it she sucks her thumb or something or touches her eye. Yeah, it was so cute. And you know, it's a totally new person and you have to to know one another in a sense. So it's more like 
it's like introductions time and it's hey my name is Keon Jerry and I am zero days old and yeah I like touching my eye with my finger even though that's totally wrong we had started bonding with her and it wasn't I, I wouldn't say it's love at first sight and oh you feel connected from the onset no i say it's more like you know for me anyway it was more like yeah let's know one another and let's let's see where this takes us and that's when the we noticed that she looked really like me i also didn't expect that to happen but to be quite honest i didn't i never minded it <laughs> even right now i feel so overwhelmed by the idea that of meeting kyo the first day in hindsight that was such a beautiful moment but given how tired we were i didn't i don't think we appreciated it much then as we we do now as i said we are getting to know kyo kyo is getting to know us kyo doesn't has never been in this world so she has been in a warm place where she gets food via placenta and now she's getting food via uh mommy's boob and before you can connect all those dots before she can get comfortable enough to you know just be there's a lot of friction there that's what I do. <laughs> there's just a lot of friction there and uh what did we struggle with the most uh, we struggled with everything everything it didn't help that we had labored for 24 hours non-stop and hadn't slept as uh, and say Sally hadn't slept i wish we got her some time to sleep but nobody prepares you for that but i wish you know Kyo was in the maternity room and not in your room for at least one day so that you get just that you know good night sleep in hindsight it's okay that we struggled with her since it I'd say we all grew stronger from that. We didn't grow weaker from that. We didn't break from that. We grew stronger. So I remember changing her nappies was hard. I remember breastfeeding was hard. I remember getting her to sleep the first few days. Oh my god. Hi hi hi. Hi. Thank God we now have a child who we just put into bed and she just sleeps. <laughs> I I remember when he started past to you that by god ah, yeah. we can't take that for granted to me talk ambali time and I appreciate the support that we had from our parents and all the people that were around us to just tell us you know it's just it won't it would it doesn't it's not going to be forever it's like you know you're not going to be in this place forever it, it gets better with time i remember those words vividly for the trimester i'd say was the hardest bit for us in a sense getting to know kyo getting to know who she is what she wants because you know she's a human individual by herself she she wants to sleep at this certain time she wants to eat this way she wants to she doesn't want to feel cold appreciating that and learning that and also knowing what to give her at the right time it's very it's something that comes with time it, you just you she just doesn't come from the tummy and it's natural and i know i don't know how it's going to be with our second one we we might say we are prepared but given everybody is different beautifully so in the sense that you know kyo's sister or brother will be a different person we don't know maybe the the brother or sister will be sleeping the whole day and you know easy to deal with but we don't know how that will be and just appreciating that i think we'll go along with in our second one and our third one and our fourth one okay <laughs> fana used to be the one who was great at burping he like had a master's degree he was also the one who could calm her down to sleep Fana is also the one who helped her sleep independently because what would happen is that and I think we started this after she was 3 months old I stopped breastfeeding at night so I'd pump milk and then go to sleep at I think 8 p.m. so that I get enough sleep and and wait for her when she wakes up during the night but he would stay up a little bit later and then feed her wake her up and feed her 
uh, bottle feed her and then just simply put her back to bed. She wouldn't even cry. She would just be put in bed and would sleep. And I, I remember the first few mornings I would wake up and be like, she just slept like that. So I was very convinced that that could only happen during night sleeps. But then when I would leave the house during the day and not be able to make it back in time for nap times, Fana would have already put her to bed. So he's the one who unlocked our sleep, <laughs> our sleep patterns. So he he has a master's degree in dealing with little kids. Personally, I think <laughs> I don't know how much of that is based off luck or being in the right place at the right time. They say sometimes that's what you need in life, just being in the right place at the right time. And a lot of luck. I'd say it's mostly based off that because, for example, the bapping thing, you know, at the end of the day, as a father, you don't have, you know, a boob, which is the primary way that, you know, an infant will feed. So at the end of the day, I need to play my part and my part needs to be everything else other than that. And I have to, and I need to give as much in and for me, bapping and rocking her to sleep, bottle feeding her. I liked, I loved bottle feeding her. I was a bit apprehensive at first, given I was like, there's some comfort she gets from the boob. But when I started doing it, it was quite nice. Like, you know, I, we bonded at that time as well. So I would say I was more lucky, Sally, to be quite honest. And I didn't know that when I was placing her in bed, that that was going to be how you are going to unlock her sleep. I was, uh, I was lucky. I was, that's what I'll say. I was lucky and I was in the right place at the right time. And I was doing my best to support my family at the same time. At the end of the day, what matters most for me is my family and supporting them in any way possible. COVID was the blessing in disguise for us one way or another. So even professionally for me, having my own space, I noticed by working from home, I can work better. I had a clearer mind uh, working from home. And I noticed quite quickly that, you know, this working from home thing is quite, it's, it's a vibe. And it's very productive in a sense. So, and not only that, I could stay with my wife and interact with her through the day. There's a lot of importance I place to that, especially culturally. If you're looking at an African perspective, the home is where everything used to happen. It was the center per se. And as it stands right now in this modern life, the office is actually the center of everything. We spend a half of the day for for some people in the office. And having an opportunity where you can actually live at home and interact with these people at home in a day-in, day-out perspective is powerful because there is no other way where you build bonds other than actively taking time and being very, very conscious about the time you take with people. That's the only way you create bonds. And I believe that strongly. And if you're going to spend most of your day in the office, in such a scenario, I'd never, for example, be seeing Keo given she wakes up at seven and sleeps at seven. If I'm going to be at the office at that same time, I'd never interact with her as I interact with her right now. And I'm filled with a lot of love when I see Keo. And that love, I believe, is not only generated by me being her father, the mere fact that I am her father, because there are a lot of people who are fathers but would care less about their children. But I believe it's, it's created more by actively looking for moments where you interact together with your daughter and there's a lot to say about remote work and working from home that encourages that bonding and moving forward i know this is these are discussions we have actively with Sabi. like you know do we really want to go back to work actively in physical spaces if fast i'm going to waste that time traveling to the office i'm also going to 
burn a lot of fuel. You know, I don't have an electrical car yet. <laughs> Do we need to be in the office? Can't we work at home? And I'm thankful my career has afforded me that. I'm thankful Sally's career has afforded her that. You know, I can't wait to see who Keo is going to be growing up. I already know, have a feeling of who she is right now and the things I hope she'll never drop. Her opinionatedness, her confidence, her happiness and giving life to another is a gift that I pray that you enjoy as well. It's a huge responsibility, don't get me wrong, but it's a great responsibility, I'd say. And um, maybe something else is just, you know, I can't also wait to see the other siblings we bring care. It's going to be a huge responsibility for us, impacting knowledge, impacting love, impacting all these various things that we need to do as parents. But it's a journey I want to take. I don't want career success if I don't have family success. For me, family always comes first. That's where I'm. That's my story personally. And I just want to share it in the best way that I'd, uh, that I'd have wanted to share it. And I feel as if Mama Tales has been the perfect medium for that. And thank you, Sally, for giving me this opportunity. I know I'm, I'm more of a Baba Tales than a Mama Tales, <laughs> but <laughs> I've loved every minute of this. And to all dads out there, support your wives, support your partners, and it's a beautiful experience to be in. That was a really great, fun episode to record. I truly loved taking a sneak peek into his mind and thought process. Um, so super grateful that he was game to be part of this. Actually, he is the one who insisted for the longest time. So, <laughs> so, so I'm glad that we finally got around to doing it. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there who do all that they can for their family. We truly, truly appreciate you. So if you'd like more content around this podcast and just general mom life, please follow me on Instagram at Sally Mogore. I'll leave the details below. If you want to share something on this platform, please feel free to contact me either on Instagram DM or on email at mamatillspod at gmail.com. I'll leave all those details down below. Oh, and in other news, we took the trip to Atamu that I was talking about last episode. It was beautiful. It was restful. And baby Keo had the time of her life just walking around, exploring and literally just bathing in sand. I'll break down the trip a little more in detail, especially if you're thinking about traveling with a little one on um, Instagram. All right. You have a great week, day, night, depending on when you get to listen to this episode. And I will catch you later on the next one. Bye.